take up words. So, dear students, dear colleagues, welcome and thank you for joining us for the first international webinar organized by Faculty of Economics, Business and Tourism, University of Split, and supported by Creation Section of European Regional Science Association. Coronavirus is forcing all actors to modify many of their plans and strategies overnight. Being developed in response to the challenging, changing needs, this webinar should represent an essential guide to understanding the key facts and offer a chance to ask questions, learn what others are doing, and gain advice how to make the best decision for our local and regional community. Keeping in mind our goals, I would like to introduce today's presenters uh, representing Node Regio, a leading Nordic and European Research Center for Regional Development and Planning, established by Nordic Council of Ministers. So it's my privilege to introduce Alberto Giacometti, research fellow specialized in regional development governance and planning process, and Yuka Teras, senior research uh, fellow specialized in regional development, innovation environments, innovation promotion, technology transfer, and all the issues related to the non-metropolitan regions. The title of their speech is Nordic Perspective of Resilience in Post-Corona World. Before we start, a few technical and organizational tips. We will start with 15 minutes presentation and after we will have up to 20 minutes for questions and answer session. Please, just to be on safe side, turn off your camera and mute microphone during the presentation. In your left corner, you have the icons so that we can have stable and smooth link with our speakers. After presentation, you will be kindly asked to turn on your camera and microphone and start with the discussion. Thank you. Alberto and Yuka, the stage is yours. Good luck. Thank you. Can you hear us? Yeah, perfectly. Good. Uh, I am trying to share the slides. Is it possible to see them? Yeah. Good stuff. So we thought that I will give the first one minute. This is you, Katera, speaking here, and then Alberto runs the presentation. So thank you, Professor Bingo, for a kind presentation. And uh, mm. we are at the moment in Stockholm, Sweden. We work for the Nordic research institution called Nordregia. And uh, we are having a voluntary home quarantine if we wish. We are not uh, having a lockdown, but we still have the Sweden as uh, locked as many other countries in, in practice. And uh, I hope you, you like the presentation given by Alberto, uh, but uh, after that, uh, we really encourage you to join the discussion. I think Alberto, just uh, start the presentation, please. Yes, thank you. If, if you can hear me well, I'll, uh, I'll go on. And um, these um, this, uh, times of coronavirus is uh, become very, uh, lift up this topic of resilience uh, again, uh, and that which has already been, uh, we, we should say, a, a buzzword uh, over the, the last couple of years. Um, so, we were already introduced where we come from and so but what what really is resilience and uh, what do we why do we talk about it uh, in this context we have uh, at Norregio carried a, a study about uh, regional resilience over the last couple of years uh, so so if, if you're interested in, in knowing the details uh, I, I I'm sure Vinko can share with you the study and policy brief uh, so why is resilience uh, becoming relevant in this in this uh, case? Uh, well, uh, it, it resilience comes in the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the context of of, of major disturbances uh, and to a system. Uh, always, when talking about resilience, you have to think of the of the unit of analysis, be it a, an individual, a person, uh, uh, the healthcare system, you could say, or a territory with all the components that are inside. So in, in a crisis like uh, COVID, uh, it, it is a generalized crisis, it affects every, every country, every part of the system. So, but it's always important to, when, when uh, reflecting on, uh, from the resilience perspective, to think of what, what is that uh, unit of analysis. And um, 
resilience, the term itself, comes from the Latin root resilire, which means to, to, to leap back or to rebound. So you have the, the, the normal or, or, or a situation and then you have a shock and then you have what happens after. How do you go back? Uh, back to normality and uh, in in our study we focus on the on the re regional resilience so that was our unit of analysis the regions or territories and uh, and and in in this context uh, how how a region is resilient depends on the ability of that region to both anticipate uh, the shock but also how to how to prepare and respond to to whatever disturbance or, or shock and uh, Hopefully not to bore you with too much literature, but uh, uh, in the literature there is different uh, different ways to, to of thinking on how uh, how this process happens. How how do we prepare or recover to uh, from a disturbance? So uh, in in some of the literature and also depending on the on the tradition of the discipline, it is more from physics or from ecosystems or more in the social sciences. Uh, we speak either of bouncing back or bouncing forward. So you can say that uh, bouncing back uh, implies that that after the shock we go back to the pre-shock normal. So the e previous previous e equilibrium by recon reconstructing reconstructing uh, whatever parameters were there before. And there's another uh, way of thinking that is is more a bouncing forward. So. So if we if we assume that we no, we are not going back to where we were before, but we are gonna replace this uh, with a, with a new normal, a new uh, set of uh, structures that will define uh, the 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 new, the new the future, you could say. And then of course we can be even more critical and uh, and, and assume that there is not such a thing as a, as an equilibrium or, or normal at any point of time. So there is nothing to go back nor go forward. I mean, we the economy is 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 complex, is non-linear, is dynamic. So uh, so so ups and downs is is, is, is are, are always there. Uh, uh, but in this in this context, uh, even though uh, we could say that the economy and society is dynamic and always changing. Uh, the, it, it also depends on the intensity of these disturbances. Uh, so if you look at this graph, it's, it's a useful way uh, to think uh, around resilience. So if, if you have small, small uh, shocks, if you see to the, to the left side of this graph, so if the intensity is low, you could say that you can have some kind of stability and, and, um, and, and your system needs uh, some kind of absorptive capacity. So, so that you can have a persistence, you can, you can, you can continue with these basic structures of your system, go on as uh, business as usual, you could say, uh, without uh, without much trouble. But if the intensity moves, so if, if it moves toward the, the right hand side of the graph, um, the, the 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 shock or disturbance be, uh, uh, affects much more the system, and then you you could say that the system needs more flexibility or adaptive capacity. And typically, this happens not in radical ways, but in incremental adjustments. So little changes here and there that that uh, that help the system go to a new to a new place. But if the intensity is, is completely to the right hand side of the uh, the graph, if if the shock really means a, a structural transformation of uh, of everything, economic and society, then of course we need. Uh, responses that, uh, that, that, that lead to a complete transformation of society. So this, this is just a frame or a way of thinking. And, um, and as I mentioned before, I mean, resilience is based on a system. So every, every unit of analysis, in this case, every region, every individual will not necessarily be affected in the same way. Uh, so so even though uh, shocks or disturbances can be global and can affect everyone, but the the, the, the impact locally uh, is, is 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 different. So uh, here is where 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 the context matters. What how is that structure? How is that system structured? Uh, what are the, uh, the 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 other industries and 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 the, and the context around that that make this. Uh, unit more able to resist to these different uh, disturbances. And here um, 
we could talk about many different components uh, about the context and about the the, the, the other underlying pressures in society because we're we are never absent of risks or stress. We have a lot of different uh, in combination. So, but but something that uh, that is uh, that is critical in uh, and, and as a result of our study is the role of this social construct. Uh, we can have as many systems to cope with with with, uh, with um, disturbances, but uh, we can never be hundred percent prepared to what is uncertain, uh, uncertain or unpredictable. So here, the importance of the social contract, uh, the cultural characteristics, and the and the people's readiness to cope uh, with transformation matters a lot. And here, um, and Vinko has uh, pointed us to us several times in the past, how important this trust uh, relations between different actors in, in, in society uh, matter and how, in particular in the Nordic countries where trust uh, is quite high uh, compared to other parts of the world. Um, as I mentioned already briefly, we 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 are never free of uh, of uh, any kind of uh, risks. There is always something in the back. So it's it's good to normalize the idea that there is always threats. The question is more: what is that that, that landscape of threats of risks and how they come uh, in together? So we we did, we made an effort to to map a number of different ones, mostly from an economic perspective. But there is there is many. Uh, political, environmental, and uh, other issues that that can have a, a major impact in the economy. And here we see we already identified back then uh, pandemics as as one of the potential, uh, you could say, environmental uh, or natural uh, uh, issues that can that can disturb the system, also economy and society at large. And uh, one interesting exercise we've conducted with uh, with uh, local actors uh, from from different perspectives, from business, from uh, 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 government, uh, and, uh, and and so on, is 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 this one that that we have here. So, so we use two axes: this probability and impact, and high and low in either side, and we have these quadrants. And typically, if you ask people uh, what what are the risks. Uh, not everyone will dare uh, saying uh, those that are not very probable. If we, if we, for instance, to talk about this pandemic, maybe one year ago, nobody would have said that we have a high likelihood that a pandemic will affect every aspect of our system. So they will put it in the wild cards, perhaps, if they mentioned it at all. Uh, but this was an interesting exercise that uh, that helped the thinking and what are, what are the many uh, Risks in that, uh, in in the, in the what is the risk landscape and uh, many interesting things develop. Even though, because we want to be critical to the idea that that all shocks are unpredictable. Yeah, perhaps where it comes from is unpredictable, but uh, there is a series of domino effects after any kind of shock that that can be similar. Uh, regardless of, of where it's the origin. So already many people mentioned, uh, this is the results of one of the workshop. Uh, people already uh, predicted uh, problems with food scarcity, if uh, there is trouble with supply chains, uh, there is trouble with uh, the, the, the political and geopolitical situation with unstable EU, with oil price, uh, volatility. And so many things that, that uh, often uh, come uh, to light with any kind of crisis. And of course, uh, once you have mapped these different kind of risks, uh, you can more easily uh, identify what are the factors that strengthen resilience. And uh, of course, uh, shocks are not just negative. On the contrary, uh, we, we firstly believe that shocking events always bring opportunities for uh, for innovation, for business renewable, adaptation to new market demands and change, uh, often through reorganization of the basic structures or uh, not only from a regional perspective, but also individual. How do we uh, self-organize? How do we change our routines or how do we do things differently uh, to cope 
with whatever situation we are uh, at now, but often it has even positive consequences in the long run. We see that also with business innovation and uh, new business uh, ideas emerging out of uh, the bad times. So taking, turning their weaknesses into opportunities. And uh, one, one uh, example that we can use here is for instance, the oil, oil price, price shock uh, from 2014 that catalyzed a lot of uh, restructuration in Norway, especially in the region of Rogaland, where uh, they, they identify many new ways of, of working within the public sector. And in business, there were a lot of knowledge spillovers. So knowledge that engineers, engineers from the oil sector were then able to use in, in new industries. Just but if they wouldn't have lost their jobs, they wouldn't have started other businesses. So this catalyzed a lot of new uh, positive uh, things in the long run. And um, as I mentioned, we, we came up with a long list of policy recommendations that, that, uh, that, that could be relevant for you. So, uh, well, we call them our Ten Commandments from this study, but you, you can read more uh, if, if, if Pinko shares with you uh, later on. Uh, so, as I said, we have links that you can, where you can find. So, thanks, and uh, I think I'll stop here and I'll move on with, with what we wanted to discuss uh, in relation to COVID. Uh, and I think I, I leave uh, Yuka to, to make it maybe moderate the, the discussion and maybe give some comments about this. Thank you, Alberto. And uh, this is our last slide, and we are, we are moving to the discussion part. Uh, one practical hint there is also the chat function. So please use that if you wish to send us comments, remarks, or questions. Uh, discussion, discussion questions. We had a word uh, before this seminar uh, together, together with the organizers, and we listed uh, three questions here uh, we would be very curious to hear more from you also could we have anticipated this coronavirus or covid or at least uh, that something happens and there are economic and social consequences of it and uh, you can imagine for example tsunami or earthquake or something like that so was is this totally surprising us uh, as uh, individuals, as research people, as students, or what is happening. The second uh, question we, we, we wanted to highlight is that uh, we believe that the next crisis is behind the door. Uh, we are talking about uh, the maybe the second or third wave of this corona, but it could be something else. It could be financial crisis, whatever it is. How should we prepare for that? Or do, does it happen again like it has happened? That uh, we live one, two years, we start uh, gradually forgetting, and again in seven, eight years, we will be surprised. And can we do something with our research uh, and the knowledge, uh, knowledge people of that? The third one is kind of... Uh, 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 sharing with you the, the experiences we have had in Nordic and Swedish uh, Nordic countries and, and Sweden of how to handle with this COVID. And uh, it's, a, it's a human tragedy. People are dying and, and we, we are really having our elderly people in, in panic. But uh, I think the long-term consequence will be outside the health. It's this economical and social situation. I just had a look on today's uh, COVID statistics and I find that uh, Croatia, 2,000 uh, contaminations and, and 69 nine, uh, lost people and, uh, and uh, uh, it's, it's not that much compared to, to Swedish countries. However, we know that uh, very close there you have the Italy and inside Italy you have the Lombardy and, and, and uh, we have the other extreme there. But it doesn't matter what, what are these health issues because the countries are locked down. And we had been able to visit uh, Croatia many times with Alberto, thanks to cooperation with the university. And uh, of course, we are wondering, for example, about the tourism and beaches. However, the last slide of Alberto, you saw some snow there. We have also our Arctic tourism now in the lockdown. So, so what's happening there? 
and uh, I think also what is interesting, what is the exit strategy? One day this health issue will be at least lower, but, but uh, shall we continue three or four years in this uh, misery? And uh, how do we go out of, out of that? And uh, I think uh, the last point I want to, uh, to say is also that uh, at Nordregia, we don't see it only as a negative thing or threat, but we are already looking for opportunities. And one of the opportunities we together are experiencing today, this digital leap. So, so we are testing using new new technologies and we are not only waiting, waiting for them, we, we are using, some of you are younger than me, so, so it's not a big deal, but, but for, for the older generations, it's also a digital leap. So, so that, and the whole society starts using it. And think about if we can share this with, with our elderly care or hospitals, so that the, instead of calling the receptionist, the, they connect us to the screen of the people there without the digital uh, capabilities. We are... We have been far away from there and maybe now we are weeks from there. So maybe this opens the whole new avenue and these are the opportunities also we would like to discuss. But I think uh, uh, Albert and me, we stop here and uh, I think we give uh, the floor back to Binko and then we open the floor to, to also to questions and uh, and. Uh, I see the first question coming into the chat also. We take it in a second, but uh, thank you for that. But please sending these, these comments. But now back to, back to Vinko, as they say in television. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. It was quite extremely interesting presentation. And I open now the floor for your questions. So please, all the participants, you have opportunity to ask or to offer some of your discussions with our dear guests from Sweden. So please. And I think uh, the first two ones we have already, if you open the chat, if you yeah. all have not opened, uh, there is a question from Robert and uh, the question goes like this. Oh, oh did, did I already miss that? Great, you are, you are sending this in. Uh, will companies keep more cash on hand after the crisis? Because right now that cash would be a lot of help. I can start with that because uh, I got a phone call one week ago from an entrepreneur. I know him from 25 years ago. He has experienced uh, personal crisis, company crisis and, and financial crisis. And he called me and said, uh, uh, Jukka, it's again showtime. We have to take care of our wallets. It's, it's cash time. So, so I congratulate Robert here uh, because this is what, what's happening with the private entrepreneurs. We are having our income statements, balance sheets and uh, production, but cash is the king here. When, as long as you have cash you or ca cash equivalent, we don't have uh, maybe the bills anymore in our pockets, but, but this to be, to, to be converted immediately to cash, this is something we really need. And this is one of the lectures. And if you inter interview with the people who have experienced previous crises, they know it. And, uh, and uh, at the same time, you know people who have invested in, in uh, for example, real estate in wrong places, and now they cannot uh, convert it back to cash. But uh, Alberto, any inspirations to this first question? cash issue yes well uh, and, and following on on uh, Josip's question further down yes the Nordic yes. region is of, is of course also heavily affected uh, 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 it's only in Sweden that has taken a, a bit more moderate approach but all other Nordic countries are under a strict lockdown so uh, all companies are affected big air companies are affected but all businesses in general are, are suffering um, the, the the states have of course offered uh, quite generous I would say compared to other countries uh, support uh, in many cases companies and uh, different employers can apply for uh, uh, state support that uh, uh, to pay part of the salary in a, in a temporary basis uh, during this lockdown 
So uh, there is, uh, depending on how desperate companies are, they can apply for a 20, a 40, and even 80% of salaries being paid by the state. Uh, and um, so, so that's one way to cash in, to, to pump the cash that is so desperately needed and that it also generates the flow, of course, uh, in society. Of course, if people buy. Uh, in strict lockdowns, it's, it's hard to keep the money flowing, but uh, in Sweden, for instance, there, is, uh, there, there are many things open. So, so to some extent, the money is, is, is hasn't stopped flowing. But cash is, is, definitely the, is definitely the issue here. And I can, I can continue from the Josip question there before we move on to Smiljana and others. Josip asks about the impact of, uh, on the economy in Sweden. This uh, is also related to the question of what we had at Nordregia today. How are the big uh, international organizations assisting or helping? And uh, we know the discussion between European Commission and Italy. They are apologizing Italy that they have not intervened. And, uh, and uh, we are also, again, the word trust comes to the figure. So as long as sun shines, we say that we have trust. And when the rain starts pouring, we don't seem to have that same trust when it comes to international organizations and crisis regions. So this is a tough question and, and we don't have the answer there. And also personal opinion here is that you read from the newspapers, you hear from TV, these gigantic uh, support packages uh, from uh, European Commission and World Bank. Uh, please read carefully. Some of them are only redirecting the already allocated money or renaming them. Some of them say that we have this uh, gigantic uh, package of money. Is it support? Is it a loan at this age of 0% loans? or is it loan guarantees? So some of these instruments are good, but some of them are bad. And again, back to the first question, what about companies? If they already are in trouble, why should they take extra loan so that the boat will sink with the loans? I think this, uh, this uh, huge gap between the top, top, top level thinking and the real situation of companies, this is also a question mark. So I would say that northern regions and companies are affected, but we have this trust which seems to help and it, it, it seems to be very important. Uh, maybe I introduce the th next question also because it's from Smil Smiljana. Any studies uh, into the resilience of tourism sector and uh, and I think I will give the floor back to, back to Alberto because you you had some tourist cases when uh, sun was shining in in the winter time in in northern Sweden, for example. So how does that scenery look like? Yeah, well, I I, I can't uh, I, I can't tell from any recent studies uh, connected to this specific crisis. Uh, that I'm not familiar myself, but uh, but we've we've we have seen that that tourism is very fragile and it is very seasonal. Uh, so so it, 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 the risk is not even from from uh, from big shocks like this, but even from from minor ones or even tendencies. If the trend uh, moves from uh, now, we are not so interested in in, uh, in 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 Caribbean, but now we are interested in in. Uh, winter tourism, so people move from different directions. So it's, it's also what is, what is trendy, what is fashionable. So we, I, I, I wouldn't know how to compare it to many other uh, sectors my, uh, in, a, in, a, in a concrete way, but, but definitely we, we've, we've seen that the tourism sector is, is one of those that are, is very volatile, uh, in, similar with, with energy sectors and, and so on. Um, I wanted to, also uh, respond to to Lydia if 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 we can if we can predict uh, or, pr or prepare at all to an avalanche of potential crises and um, I just I just want to note that um, that only a decade ago we were in a different crisis we were in the financial crisis and uh, 
even in between, they maybe not didn't affect every country, but affected many countries. The, the, the oil crisis in 2014, not only oil but uh, natural resources. Um, we we have been through many of these crises. So so th there is. Um, it, they, uh, crises are unpredictable in timing in many ways, but the domino effects uh, can be to, us some, to some extent pre predicted. So I can, I can refer back to, to our list of recommendations. We, do, uh, we did mention a lot about the importance of generating awareness, awareness of, the, of those permanent risks that are there uh, and, and, and how uh, the, the importance of every actor in society to even to the individual level to be to know about this and that if if society at large knows that uh, that the systems or the government uh, institutions are not are are, in, are never ready enough to cope with an avalanche of of, of crisis as you put it uh, then people themselves are better ready to react to self-organize to help each other uh, we see that there is much more voluntary work, much more assistance across the community when there is awareness and trust among people. So, so awareness and trust is one thing. But of course, we speak about financial buffer, spreading the risk. Uh, if, if you have just tourism as the only industry, well, the, the, the risk is concentrated. So we know that as long as the risk is concentrated, um, the, 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 we are not very resilient. And, and so th that's a number of things. Uh, we, we can also talk about redundancy. I don't think we use it here, but redundancy is, is also a, a term used, for instance, when it comes to infrastructure. If, if you have one bridge, uh, the, the, if that bridge collapses, you have no transport. But if you have two bridges, even if normally you don't need them, then uh, you, you, you can go away. So. I would say there's a there's a, 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 a quantity of recommendations that I can tell, but maybe I want to emphasize on the flexibility. So we've uh, we, we've we've seen that uh, nor, now the changes are going very fast in education, in economy, uh, in politics. So uh, we have highlighted the importance of flexible education, flexible institutions, fled, flexible uh, society. Uh, which which makes people more uh, ready to adapt when something unpredictable happens. Uh, Maybe I can continue continue from th there. Flexibility and also that you have plan B, back to the tourism question. So mm -hmm. if you put all your eggs on, for example, getting Chinese tourists, uh, that was the case for some winter tourism places and also maybe an analogy to Croatia, so that uh, uh, you should have this plan B if the foreign tourists disappear totally, how much can we compensate with the domestic tourists? So I think flexibility and always having the plan B in the back pocket, I think that is for the company base good. And also after the financial crisis, our countries, the banks are not in perfect shape, but they are in much better shape than they were. And one more example I heard yesterday that the national uh, airline company in, in Finland, Finnair, they have 1 billion euros cash. And people have been criticizing that they have not used the cash to invest more into Chinese routes or the new, 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 fly, uh, new airplanes. But now they can survive with this, uh, this cash uh, more than one year so that they are in a much better position than, for example, Lufthansa or some other airlines in, in crisis. And uh, thank you, Robert, for this, this comment. Please remember it. I think we all should remember it. Uh, so so, so in, in a way, uh, be prepared for the, for the tough times. And then we have also from Pasco coming a new question there. Which are the main factors that will influence the recovery after the crisis? from the perspective of specific country. And uh, at least we can say that some countries come sooner, come easier out of, the, out of the crisis situation. And now we come back to the Alberto's presentation, something for you also to consider afterwards, people analyze it more carefully. What, has it been totally 
uh, correct that we have this either or lockdown or open in Sweden. I come from Finland. Sweden is not my home country, but I see that there is some flexibility. People do something voluntarily. Not all obey the rules, but most of people obey the rules. And Sweden is not doing that well with the the COVID statistics, but uh, economically they are doing much, much better than many other countries because many of the activities have not been 100% locked down during the crisis and and people say that we got come out of this crisis together and and uh, i think there is at least uh, something that uh, time will tell if if sweets were right and also also i want to share this uh, this uh, need to compromise so it's not that easy that we have to save the lives we have to save the lives yes but uh, but if people get depressed and if this crisis continues three or four years then we get people uh, in other types of health crises like depression etc so that it's it's a it's a more complex than yes or no question and not only going to john hopkins or worldometer statistics for for the situation of today so i think uh, this is something to be remembered there would you like to comment on that uh, alberta i'd like to comment of what are the key factors i, I think uh... I think it's a very big, big question, and, and uh, oh, I'm, I'm not, uh, I'm not in the financial sector to to, to tell all the financial uh, uh, measures that need to be made. But, 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 but we need to. We can look at, for instance, the, the previous financial crisis, and we do see that some some regions and some countries did bounce back or did come up uh, from the crisis better than others, um, and 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 especially the Nordic countries were some of those that came up uh, quite quickly out of that. And, and some, of the, some of these uh, factors is, is, is the general systems of support. I mean, we, we have seen the importance of a, of a, of a strong welfare system, uh, uh, strong institutions and so on. So that, that, that plays a very important role. But not only, I mean, we, we have also seen uh, the importance of this speed, the, the how quickly we are at taking measures. I mean, companies need the cash today, as we talk about cash. We need the cash today. If we if we take the, the decisions too too slowly, if we come up with a solution six months later, I, I'm sorry, KO for the companies. They have uh, they have disappeared probably. Uh, they are out of business. And um, I think this this speed of reaction is uh, is, is very important. Um, and uh, also, uh, the, the, the importance of uh, the, the more informal ways of uh, collaborating. So uh, while you have to, on the one hand, the national level perhaps uh, measures, but, but if, if you look at the more local level, how the different uh, actors come to play. And uh, when looking at the many, many of the bigger crises uh, in the Nordic countries, uh, we have seen the importance of how uh, the key actors in society, and, and this can vary depending on the crisis. But let's say it can be it can be uh, some key institutions, but maybe also university, maybe also a specific industry that sit down in a table in a rather informal way and discuss. Well, how do we come out come out of the crisis? So, so this culture of collaboration has been very important in the Nordic countries. Um, very good. I could uh, I could continue from there, Lydia. Excellent question there. Do you think that tourism, as we know so far, massive, can be considered to be a shock itself in an economy? You are reading nicely what we had written with uh, with uh, Alberto. Spread the risk was uh, commandment number two or three in our list, and uh, and uh, and uh, this is highly relevant now for the situation of the beaches in, in lovely beaches in Croatia. What shall we do in? the situation of today what should have it be done i think we should have invested as you have done but how to spread the risk should we have attracted should we still attract for example amazon to have logistics or invest more in knowledge besides the tourism so not all eggs in the same yeah. basket it, it sounds like a, a trivial but that's the that's the case and um, yeah 
think of just tell us if we are going over time, but uh, you have so good questions coming here. Robert continues also again with this, with, with this cash thing and um, will this crisis revolutionize the way we do business? Uh, uh, many people say that yes, it's the whole new world and uh, we know that after two or three years uh, some things just go back to the old normal. But I think that's, that keeping a, a reasonable amount of cash to prepare financially, mentally, and also with, with, with uh, other, other issues, I think this preparedness is the word, including financial preparedness. And, uh, and in these ages of zero interest, I think it's not that easy to get a dividend otherwise either. Pasco again with a resilience and recoverment possibilities of EU economics, would it be bouncing back or bouncing forward? Uh, uh, I think uh, there is a nice English word of agility. The ones who can really adapt and use the situation, they would, would not only bounce back, they would also bounce forward. And, uh, and uh, I think this is a mindset question also. If we are only kind of uh, making recovery and, and uh, preparing the house back from the earthquake, then we never bounce forward. But we would need to see new opportunities. And, and uh, I think EU doesn't do it, but people inside EU do it. And there is even some EU money for that uh, thing. And then we have the Vingo. We have just uh, one minute for, for a final message. And I think... Uh, a pity to leave the Ivan Vladimir, but I think uh, Vinko, I give the floor now to you. Yeah. Thank you, thank you, Alberto. Thank you, Yuka, on an extremely interesting discussion. And definitely, uh, when we had started planning this webinar, we didn't expect to have enormous interest that we have at the moment. But I think that for the first time, I would like to stop now. Uh, maybe it's going. Maybe this uh, event will be just an invitation for our second event uh, with you, with other colleagues from North Regio, and we definitely will would like to find all different options for uh, cooperation with North Regio. Once more, thank you, Alberto, and thank you, Yuka. But exceptional webinars require more than just great presentation. They need valuable content, and we have it. And importantly, we have engaged viewers. So thank you very much for joining us today, especially uh, on this beautiful day, at least in Split. And hope to see you soon. And definitely please join us on our next webinar on May 6th, next Wednesday, 2020. So thank you very much. Enjoy your day and hopefully see you soon. Bye-bye. Thank you very much. Congratulations for an excellent concept of webinars.